they talk about it every day somewhere. If I go to a foreign country, magic, magic, we're magic. It's the same everywhere. We don't have to see each other. We don't have to say hello. We don't have to call each other. That's my main competition. It's always been like that. You know you got this tight bond with this cat, and you don't have to see him for a year or two. Um, but you're always going to be linked to him. We got this connection that's never going to be broken. I mean, right to our graves. They'll be talking about this 100 years from now. It all began here in Salt Lake City, Utah on the night of March 26, 1979. It was the NCAA championship, Indiana State versus Michigan State, a game that still ranks as the highest rated college final ever on television. A game that's now remembered as a prologue to a rivalry that transformed a sport and intertwined two legacies. But on that night, March 26, 1979, the first time Magic Johnson and Larry Bird ever went head-to-head -head on a basketball court. They were simply two young men trying to win a very big ball game. Well, this is probably the biggest game I'll ever play in my life, and I just feel like, you know, I'm representing not only myself, my team, but we're representing our school and our, and our town, Terre Haute. Well, it's uh, a dream come true, really, for me. Uh, I won the state title back in my home state, and. Then my next accomplishment was going to the NCAA and playing in a, a game like tonight in the finals. They were two stars thrown together by the cosmos to compete. But only one of them had been groomed for the spotlight. In his case, it seemed since birth. I think his upbringing in East Lansing really put that smile on his face in the beginning, and, and it never came off. Born August 14, 1959, Irvin Johnson grew up in Lansing, the gritty industrial capital city of Michigan. Raised under this little roof, he was one of Christine and Irvin Johnson Sr.'s 10 kids. Christine was a school custodian, while Irvin Sr. worked two jobs nearly around the clock. My father, he got up early every morning, six o'clock or so, and uh, he went to work on his trash hauling truck every single day. Around noon, he would come home, catch a nap, and then he worked for General Motors for 30 years. And he won an award for never being late and never uh, missed a day. As a youngster, Irvin displayed his own strong work ethic on the blacktop. I was out there all day long. Before we went to school, the bus leave at 7, 7.30, I was out there at 6, 6.30 working on my game. My mother sometimes had to bring me food or she would have one of my brothers and sisters go get that boy so he could eat something. From a very young age, Irvin knew what he wanted to do. He had it all planned out. My dreams were to play in the NBA and become a businessman. The first neighborhood basketball powerhouse, Sexton High. I knew the players, I knew the tradition. I wanted to be a part of that. And it was on the west side of town, which was at that time, predominantly black. But when Lansing, like many cities in the mid-70s, began busing to desegregated school system, Irvin's journey took an unexpected detour to a predominantly white school across town. My first day at Everett High School was my first time I really had to understand there was a, a race problem. Nobody white would speak to anybody black, and nobody black would speak to anybody white. A lot of racial tension, a lot of fights, rioting, 
they didn't want minorities there. He kind of shrugged it off, and basically his attitude was, okay, well, I'll, I'll overcome this. Whenever there was any racial problems, the principal would get Irvin and go talk to these kids. I can just see him with his big hands, calm down, just calm down. He'd break up fights. Talk with his friends, tell him, you know, let it go. You know, we can't fight about everything. Let's just chill, let's play basketball. And there was no dispute over Irvin Johnson's ability to play ball. His talent was so great that soon after his varsity debut, a local reporter dazzled by his exploits gave the budding star a nickname. In the beginning, I thought it was foolish and dumb. And, you know, I didn't know nothing about a nickname. Then what happened was you start saying, wait a minute, it fits my game. Hanging out with my boys on the street corners, we used to sing Temptation song. They started saying, hey, man, Magic, that's cool. And then people on the street started saying, hey, Magic. And I said, hmm. <laughs> he bought into it, and um, I think he felt he had to kind of live up to that name. And I must say that he did. He loved it. The more attention he got, you know, he just, he wanted attention from anybody he could get it from. Yeah, it does. Um, I really love the game, and uh, I just want to win. Gets it over and back, and he jams it through. Irvin Johnson. Irvin loved the dress. Nice sandal belt and pants and overcoats with the, the fur around the collar. Always had to have his afro blown out. He had to look the part, play the part. Irvin was the first guy to have a posse. He not only had a posse of a lot of black kids, he had a lot of white kids and hanging around him. Some of my white friends was like, hey man, uh, we're having a kegger tonight, won't you come on by? And I am said, what's a kegger? So he said, well, what it is, we get this big keg of beer and you just go for it. Okay, well what time does the, the kegger start? Because regular party time in our neighborhood is 10, 11 o'clock. Uh, the kegger starts at 7. I said, the party starts at 7 o'clock? I said, okay, man, I'm going to come to the kegger. We had a good time. The music was kind of bad, but we had a good time, you know. His senior year, Johnson did at Everett what he had planned to do at Sexton, win the state championship. And when it came to choosing a college, he decided to stay where the love would be assured, home in Lansing. Next year, I will be uh, attending Michigan State University. At MSU, Magic's star quickly went national. But atop the college game, he soon discovered a certain presence beside him. The first time I saw Larry Bird was actually in a magazine. Saw his stats, blown away by his stats. But let's see if he can really do it against us. And that's always a mindset of black players if he's a great white player. In 1978, after his freshman year, Magic would quickly find out when both he and Bird were chosen to play for Team USA in the World Invitational Tournament. They would put Larry Bird and I on the same team together to scrimmage, right? It, it was blowing my mind because he's dominating Jack Givens, player of the year in college basketball. Larry Bird is eating him alive. I couldn't wait to call home to tell my boys, man, this dude named Larry Bird is for real. This is the baddest white dude I've ever seen in my life. Well, I thought he was very good. There's no question about it. I, actually, I thought he was probably the best guard on the team. Irvin Johnson, look at that. Oh, what a we didn't get to play a lot, but you could tell. I think our first game was in Kentucky. We got about a 10, 12-point lead. Man, they put us in went to 25, 30, just that fast. Fast break again, three on two, Griffin. Wow! Look at that steal by Larry Bird. Take us out, the lead go back down, put us back in. That's Bird and Johnson. The show started again. When you play with Magic, there's just something about it. You want to make that extra pass. You want to get that rebound and start to break. 
we came down a couple times, I go behind my back, no look to him. He no look back to me. And I'm laying it up. I'm saying, oh, man. Here's that last play. Magic Johnson going in, drops off the bird. Bird puts it back off inside to Johnson. Super bad. This guy got game. They had some wonderful moments on the court, but they probably spoke to each other four, maybe five times during that entire time period. And, and it was more like, hello, how are you this morning, Larry? I'm good, Magic. What'd you have for breakfast? Don't remember. Have a nice day. But such curtness was hardly strange coming from Larry Bird, who was not only one of college basketball's best players, but also its biggest enigma. I think he was a mystery to the extent that, that, that he wanted to be a mystery. He didn't enjoy doing interviews. He didn't go out of his way to do them. He wasn't particularly good at them. He was kind of like, hey, this is who I am. You want to know who I am? Watch the game. That's who I am. I start to read materials that you're very quiet and you don't enjoy talking to newspaper people. Well, you know, there's different kind of newspaper paper people. Uh, there's uh, people that try to push you. You know, there's people who try to get things out of you. Things don't even pertain to basketball. And them the type of people I like to stay away from. He didn't want people talking about his family. He didn't want his mother to have to deal with that or his siblings to have to deal with that. You got to remember where Larry came from. You know, Larry was raised in a two or three room house on a railroad track. Their family probably lived on $50 a week. He was raised tough. Larry Joe Bird grew up in Southern Indiana in the twin towns of French Lick and West Baden. The Valley, as locals call it, was a tough working class area. Tiny and remote, it was one of the poorest places in the state. I didn't know that people made millions of dollars. I didn't know that everybody had a family car. I was in my own cocoon. I was in a small town with the people I knew, and I thought I'd live there for the rest of my life. Arriving Pearl Harbor Day, 1956, Larry was the fourth of six kids born to Georgia and Joe Bird. Early on, he and his older brothers earned a reputation around the valley. We were always considered troublemakers. We're either fighting amongst ourselves or there was always one of us fighting somebody. Larry was always one that kind of instigated things, you know. If I get my brother in a fight with somebody his age, I was happy as hell, because I like to see him get beat up, and that's just the way it was. If, if I got in a, a scrape with some kid and my brothers didn't come to my side, they knew that when he got home, my dad was going to whip him. Larry and my dad were best of friends. They done everything together. When my dad would go out to my grandma's house, Larry would always go with him. They'd go fishing, do a lot of things together. But Joe Bird also had a darker side, stemming from a traumatic tour of duty in Korea. Larry remembers waking up in the middle of the night hearing his father's blood-curdling screams from the nightmares he had had from the war. What happened to his father in the war affected his entire life. He was never able to quite get rid of whatever those demons were. A talented craftsman, Joe Bird struggled to hold steady jobs. And even when he was working, his demons would, on occasion, drive him to the bottle. There were times when Joe went out with the guys and had a few beers, and the wages didn't come home that night. And that didn't happen every day. Uh, it happened once in a while. But when money is as tight as it was for the birds, once in a while was a major problem for their family. My mom sometimes worked late, and sometimes she had two jobs. But that's the way it was. I worked at school during my lunch hours, worked at the local grocery store, put up hay in the summer. I mean, if you wanted money, you had to get it on your own. To young Larry, actions spoke louder than words. He was very quiet, kind of hung to himself a little bit. I saw Larry take an F in an English class because he had to get up in front of his peers and give a speech. He said, I won't do it. But he just could not get up in front of his friends and talk. He was that shy. Of course, next thing you know, when it, he knew it was time for all of us together at the gymnasium, well, there he'd be. The minute he'd get a basketball in his hand, things were totally different. Basketball was just, it came to me, seemed like easy. I didn't have the quickness. I didn't have jumping ability. I just thought the game out. By his senior year at Springs Valley High, Larry Bird had sprouted into a star. But Bird was from the Valley, hardly a hotbed of talent in the big-time world of Indiana hoops. 
the first thing they say, well, they don't play nobody down there. He's from French Lick. They don't play nobody. I think that put a chip on his shoulder, always having to prove who he was and how good he was. He was good enough for Indiana University's Bobby Knight to come calling late his senior year. And folks in the Valley couldn't have been prouder. Their local hero was heading 60 miles north to play ball for one of the best college teams in the land. Once I got to IU, it didn't take long to realize that I was out of my cocoon. I had over 30-some thousand students that I didn't have the funds. First week and a half, I thought, man, this ain't gonna work. He left after 24 days. Let my mother down. She didn't talk to me for two months. But it didn't matter what other people say. To this day, I don't care. Back in French Lick, Bird took to working for the city, hauling trash and painting park benches. Meanwhile, by that winter, his father's demons had taken him to an even darker place. By this point, Joe and Georgia were divorced, and he was behind in his payments to the family. The police came by, and of course, they all knew him. So Joe said, hey, I need a few hours to get my affairs together before you take me away. So he called Georgia, and he said, you guys will be better off without me, and I'm going to take my life. And he put the phone down, and, and he killed himself, he shot himself. When Dad passed, you know, it hurt Larry. I mean, that was his best friend. He's gone now. And, but Larry didn't show it a lot. He just didn't say much, you know, he just kind of held it within. I never, I've never heard him speak out about it at all. I was mad when I heard about it, and I was madder after the funeral because I thought he sort of cut out on us during a, a tough time. But, you know, he went, he went through a lot in his life. He did what he had to do. If Bill Hodges hadn't been as persistent as he had been, Larry Bird might never have existed in any of our minds. I believe that with all my heart. I really do. It was Bill Hodges, a young coach from Indiana State University, who convinced Bird to give college hoops another shot. So with a promise to his mom to graduate, Bird headed to Terre Haute and ISU, a school that never so much had been to the NCAA tournament. Once I started playing, it's the same old thing. You know, he's at a small school and he ain't playing against anybody, <clears throat> which is fine. Still dominated. Wherever Hoosiers gather, they no longer talk of weather. Indiana has a new state bird. Now his claim to fame is just the way he plays the game. Indiana has a new state bird. It's not the Cardinal now. Hey, Larry, take a bow. Indiana has a new state bird. By the time he had led Tiny ISU as a senior to a 33-0 record and a spot in the 79 title game, Larry Bird had become, alongside Magic Johnson, the talk of college basketball. Just a year after sharing the court on Team USA, they were back together. And the day before the big game, Magic couldn't wait to greet his old playmate. Indiana State was on practicing, and we were waiting in the tunnel. We got there early. I wanted to definitely say hello to Larry, you know. When they came through, it was like nobody was saying nothing. I wanted to go toward him, like his guys, like made sure that he didn't say nothing. And then they kind of start snickering, like, Michigan State, you in trouble. We're going to kill you guys tomorrow. I probably did snub him. I don't remember it, but I'm, I'm sure I did. I didn't want any. You know, like I call it love fest, hugging and, and, and slapping high fives with opponent. You're there for a reason. You're there to win a game. That just said it's on now. It is Indiana State against Michigan State. I'm Bryant Dumble, and the fans here are going bananas. I mean, let's face it, if, if Larry Bird were black and, and came from Chicago, it wouldn't have been as big a deal. They, they, were, they were polar opposites. One black, one white, one outgoing, one shy. That was the charm of the attraction. The bird against magic. All of the superlatives have been used, and believe me, all of them have been warranted. Heading into the tournament, magic was the bigger star. But by tip-off, it was bird. 
having hardly missed a shot in the semifinal, would become the focus of fans, and more importantly, of Michigan State. We actually had two men on Larry everywhere he went. There he is, Dick. Look at they having sandwiched in completely. I'm surprised they didn't play a box on one, you know, four guys on Larry and one on the other four, um, because that's they didn't have a lot of talent. You know, if you stop Larry, you pretty much stop them. Look at the pressure around him. Two, three, men, and he's short. I didn't play well at all. Biggest game of my life, I didn't play well. Third, way short. I think our, our length and our size, our jumping ability was able to bother him. Third, hanging, can't score. I didn't shoot well, missed, uh, I think, three free throws. Larry Bird has had a cold shooting night. I battled him, but I didn't have it. Like a shot. Oh, there's a pass. It's all over. Michigan State University, national champions, 1979. Magic, not only were you a leader on offense, I thought you did a great job on Larry Bird in the zone denying him the ball. Yes, uh, Coach uh, gave us a good game plan to go against Larry Bird, and all we had to do was go out and do it. That's what we've done. And congratulations, and Super Bowl game. It was over, you know. That was my four years. I was done. No, it still hurts. And when you win 33 in a row and you walk into a game, you know, you never know what to expect, but it, I expect to win. We didn't win. Toughest loss I ever took. I, I knew it was going to haunt him forever because we were going to see each other a lot. The National Basketball Association in its 33rd season is troubled by diminishing crowds and declining television ratings, signs that fan interest may be waning. If college basketball was flourishing at the end of the 1970s, the pro game was crumbling. After the golden era of Bill Russell and Jerry West in the 1960s, a merger with the ABA in 1976 had led not only to new teams, but a new temperament. It was a new league with new times, with renegades, with individuals. There was an argument made, plausibly, I think, that it was too black a league for the United States of America in the late 1970s. You think about the Knickerbockers at the time. The running joke was it was the Knickerbockers. You know, it was the, it, that's what it was. It, it was the N-word. It's turning off a lot of white, white customers that are coming to the game, you know? Uh, why? I think there's still a, there's a conflict between the white and the black, and uh, I don't enjoy going to the basketball and seeing all black players. I mean, I, I think it's it, when they said too black, they meant not just in terms of color, but in terms of style. Let me get mine, and the hell with yours. Basketball for us was about the best moves. You wanted to be uh, that big player that everybody talked about. You wanted to be the one. You didn't think about winning championships or team play. And those were just the issues on the court. The NBA had this image of an all-black league with a bunch of guys who did drugs. The teams were losing money, and uh, they had no sponsors. And that's pretty much a death knell right there. It's a known fact that you need your white superstars. Uh, you just need more white ball players on the team for the white fans to identify with. <laughs> And in the newest member of the Boston Celtics, that's exactly what the league appeared to be getting. There's hope he can help solve professional basketball's difficulties, which some say are compounded by a question of black and white. The great white hope, what does that mean? Well, you know, it's very hard to say because there's a lot of great white players around and, and I just hope that I can just fit in as well as some of them that has fit in. He ran away from that designation. He made it very clear, almost from day one, that he was not the great white hope. You know, the, the great players are the black players, and they're the best. Such deference meant little to black Celtics like Curtis Rowe, Sidney Wicks, and Cedric Maxwell. 
who looked at Bird and saw not the great white hope, but another case of great white hype. He didn't impress me no more than any other white guy I've ever seen play before. I think that you would say that most black players at the time were racist in, in the sense that we did not think that you could find a, a white guy who could play better than any black guy. When I walk in the first day of camp, them guys were on the floor stretching, and here comes the white savior, here comes this, here comes that. I sort of enjoyed it, because I knew I was going to battle them all day. But Curtis and Sidney didn't last long. They didn't even make it through the first practice, and they were cut. So then it was just Cedric. I'm thinking, oh, he's slow, he can't get off a shot. He's not that strong. This is going to be a layup. Bam, knocks down the jump shot. Maybe that was luck. <laughs> Gets the ball again. Bam, knocks down another jump shot. Now I'm thinking like, okay, hey, you know what? I'm gonna D this guy up. I'm gonna show him what it's like. 20 feet away, bam. 25 feet away, bam. <laughs> I, my mind just goes so good. Damn, this white guy can play. <laughs> it was a good thing too. The storied Celtics might have been the winningest team in NBA history but they were fresh off their worst season in 30 years. And in Bird, they had a player who was not only supremely talented, but tough enough to take on any challenge. You know, I always played like everybody in the world was against me. I thought everybody was against me. I used to think up things to get me rattled before a game. He knew how to fight. I know that from off the floor. One night, somebody was giving one of his buddies a hard time, and Larry went over and, you know, said, hey, you know, this is my friend, and this guy was a pretty good-sized guy. By golly, they go out back, and the guy turns and says something to Larry, and I mean, Larry hit this guy, and I caught him. Hit him so hard, I go, whoa. He was from the old school, and I, that's how he played. Larry Bird plays it to the help, baby. I played the game hard, played rough. There was no frills about him. He came in, he threw elbows. There was nothing smooth about Larry. New Englanders like that. They're hardworking people. They like that that's how people view them. And that's what Larry was. Larry Bird follows his own shot. Oh, what a point. They also like winners. And when Bird led the Celtics to the NBA championship in just his second season, he was finally one of those two. Boston loved Larry Bird. It just wasn't so clear at first how much Bird loved the city back. There's only one place I'd rather be, French Lick. Thank you. Man, Larry was almost agoraphobic in his treatment of anything outside his hometown. He wanted to be the Wizard of Oz. He wanted to intimidate people and keep them at bay. The further we are away from each other, the more I like it. I had a nice little house. I had my little yard. I want to go from there to practice back. If we had a game coming up, I want to go there to the game and back home. It was all basketball. My whole life was basketball. If he was just sitting there, it was just me, just even looking around, mumbling, trying to find things that we had in common that we could talk about. Now, we started talking about basketball. We started talking about players. It was, you know, it was great. Uh, U.S. history? No. Nope. You know, we forced passes. We made errors down the stretch. Daily events? No. I made the shot, and from then on, we was up by two, and they had to get back in the game, which they did. Politics? No. Try to not do anything I can't do or do no more than what I can do. I just go out and try to do my basic game. He proudly dubbed himself the Hick from French Lick, and he looked every bit the part. But those who played him for simple did so at their own peril. One of the great ways, I think, of winding up with no money in your pocket is to think Larry Bird is dumb. Syntax is not intelligence. Unlettered is not stupid. He's got a great sense of humor. He just didn't show that to people. That didn't mean he didn't have it. He did, however, allow the public one small indulgence. You could come out on Saturday and watch him mow his lawn. Huge crowds started to stop. Larry Bird's cutting grass in front of his house. <laughs> He's mowing his lawn in the springtime. Larry is about doing things himself. And I think it's one of the things that made him so beloved in Boston. But as Bird navigated through his new world, he still had one eye fixed on a familiar foe in a faraway land.
what tripped me out was I'm riding, right? I'm riding in the limo and I'm seeing orange trees and lemon trees in people's front yards. I said, stop, I got to go pick an orange. Are you crazy? I said, no, I got to do this. And so I ran up like a, like a scared little kid, grabbed the orange and ran back to the limo. I'd never seen an orange tree. I'd never seen a lemon tree. I was fascinated. When 20-year-old Irvin Johnson arrived in Los Angeles in the fall of 1979, he was a world away from Lansing, the only home he'd ever known. He was the number one pick of the L.A. Lakers, a once dominant franchise stuck in mediocrity. In the stoic Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the Lakers had talent, was energy. Irvin Magic Johnson was only too happy to provide it. Hello. Hello. Lit the place up, changed the franchise, changed the temperament. I changed it from the very first game. Sky hook up and good. Lakers win. Here it was, the first game of a long season against the lowly Clippers, and Magic was embracing Kareem as if they'd just won their tenth straight championship. It was like, man, this is a different kind of dude. From the day he arrived, he became the prince of the city. He reminded me of a guy who wakes up without an alarm clock, and that's what I used to always say. I want to be happy enough to wake up without an alarm clock because I want to go into my work. He had it, what it is. As far as I was concerned, the it was not his ability, or his size, the it was his attitude, was his leadership, was his mind. I mean, I don't have to talk about game six at Philadelphia. Magic Johnson will jump. In his rookie season, Magic had helped lead the Lakers to the NBA Finals against the Philadelphia 76ers. In game six, with an injured Abdul-Jabbar back home in LA, Magic played all five positions, scored 42 points, grabbed 15 rebounds, and dished out seven assists, leading the Lakers to the championship. In just four years, he had won titles in high school, college, and the pros. Magic, what do you have that makes you perform like this in these championship games? Well, I don't know, it's just, I love to win. Across the masthead of the Los Angeles Times, the next day, it said, it's magic. He was a star when, when he first arrived here, coming off the NC2A game. And quickly, during that first season, um, he became one of the stars in town, but that game, put him on another level. That made him the star in town. It's funny how I wanted to meet the celebrities, but they wanted to meet me. I was like shocked. Like, wow, well, you know who I am? He was young, famous, and after Lakers owner Jerry Buss signed him to a 25-year, $25 million contract, very rich. The kid from Lansing was ready to sample a different kind of fruit. His playboy boss knew all the ripest trees. I said, oh, I'm hanging with him. When they were coming into the box, and he had 10, 20 of them, and look, Irvin, which one you want? And I was like, oh, OK, it's like that? <laughs> and then he said, I'm going to take you to the Playboy Mansion. What? The mansion? No, you're kidding. I said, yep. So I went there, and my first time, I'm bagging up like, I can't believe I'm in, but I'm bagging up away. You know, it's like, I'm scared to death. Probably 10 guys to 100 women, you know. Everybody think it's sex-driven, but it's really not. You, you, you have dinner, then you watch the latest movie. And then, of course, I don't want to ever say that sex wasn't involved, because if you meet somebody, that's what you, know, you wanted to do, you did that. But, it's really a, a great experience to go up there. So, yeah, I had fun there. Uh, he came to L.A. like the Pied Piper. You know, people were giving him this and giving him that. But, you know, he stayed pretty grounded to the game. Everybody was getting high then. But you can't even smoke a joint around Magic. He had real old school, down in the trenches, work ethic. And that was honed in him by his dad. Irvin Johnson Sr. Magic was always this guy, you know. He never did none of that, so I did everything for him. 
Magic Johnson was living on a natural high. He was starring in the role of a lifetime, point guard of a Hollywood team with an offense called Showtime. He even had the alter ego perfect for the production. I mean, Magic was his stage name. Even he would laugh about it. Well, he always says there's two people. There's Irvin Johnson from East Lansing, and there's Magic Johnson from Hollywood. Irvin Johnson is another guy, you know. Here's Magic over here, and here's Irvin over here. Irvin is this fun-loving guy. Geronimo! <laughs> Magic was so serious and dedicated to his game, and he was a crazy, crazy competitor and a crazy man. Irvin, I think, is the smiling kid from Lansing. I think Irvin died about 25 minutes after the NCAA championship game. Irvin doesn't have the ego that Magic has. Magic got a crazy ego, and winning is everything. And Irvin wanted to, along with Magic, conquer LA. After having led the Lakers to two NBA titles in their first four years in town, Magic and Irvin were well on their way. I think Magic wanted to be friends with Larry Bird. He wanted to be friends with him on the World Invitational Tournament, and Larry just wasn't very receptive. I think he wanted to be friends with him during the Final Four. Larry wouldn't even go over and shake his hand. So now Magic's saying, well, what's with this guy? Everybody loves me. How come you don't love me? And then they get to their rookie year, the first time they play each other, well, they have a very hard foul. And they have to be separated a little bit. And Matt's just like, all right, well, the hell with this guy. You don't like me? Fine. All right, good. I don't like you either. You know, he's a, a very uh, competitive player, and I'm a very competitive player. And uh, we go head to head, and uh, we go for blood almost. The vibe was, it was nasty. It was ugly. It was, uh, we didn't like each other. I'm the one that did all that, to tell you the truth. It was, I just don't want to be hanging around him. I mean, that was my main competition. And he couldn't escape the memory of losing to him in 1979. Oh, it ate at him bad that he didn't win that national title against Magic. That was something that just burned him. It was one thing for them to be in the 79 championship. Magic had the better team. Everybody agreed with that. Magic had the better game. Fine. Now you get to the pros. Larry has this incredible year. Two, bird, a runner. It's good. But there he is watching in a club while Magic Johnson wins a championship. And he's thinking, ah, all right, I'm behind two to nothing now. I watched that game, and I couldn't believe it. I always wanted to play at that level. But what Bird couldn't possibly have known was that he had inspired Magic's performance when he was named Rookie of the Year earlier that same day. The PR person from the Lakers says, hey, Irvin, the Rookie of the Year voting has come out. And Magic says, OK, well, who won? He said, well, Larry Bird won. And Magic says, well, was it close? And he said, oh, no. He went out that day, yes, to try to win the NBA championship, but also to prove it to one Larry Bird. You know what? I should have been Rookie of the Year. Even though I won the championship, I still won the win Rookie of the Year, too. He won that championship. I was pissed. I won him one. But even after he had won one the next year, his obsession only grew deeper. I'd get up in the mornings and see what he did, because their games came on late. Then you look at the box score. I had to have him there for some reason like a crutch, somebody I can compare myself to. I hated what was being said, that Larry was better than me, and I'm just a guy who can control the game. My first four or five years, that bothered me a lot. I didn't tell nobody it bothered me, but it did. Their competitive dislike emerged from a greater truth, that on the court, they were doppelgangers. Team-oriented stars who cared about winning above all else basketball savants who fused the substance of the 60s with the style of the 70s to create a new and exciting yet selfless way to play the game in the 1980s. Yeah, I'm going to pass. But I'm going to pass in a way to make you look like a jackass. They were so similar in the way they competed. I mean, they were two halves of the same brain. Same craziness to excel. I've seen that first couple days I was with him. Basketball IQ off the chart. Seen the game a little different, most players. 
playing the game the right way was everything. A lot of guys can just score. A lot of guys can just rebound. A lot of guys can just make plays. We can do it all. Larry and Magic could control the game with 12 shots. It was amazing. They'd be 7 for 12. They'd have 20 points, 15 rebounds, and 12 assists. And you go, man, the guy shot the ball 12 times and was the best player on the court by far. But I think it was tough at first. I don't think either one of them wanted to recognize that they had any equal anywhere in what they did. But they sure as hell didn't want to recognize that their equal happened to be that other guy. That's why we hated each other, too, because we knew we were mirrors of each other. I think for a while, the two of them had, they, they had to come to grips with that. They had begun changing the game, but with continued low television ratings and tape-delayed finals, the league was struggling to get the word out. When the NBA and CBS signed a new TV deal before the 82-83 season, the rescue plan was simple. Sell more bird and magic, and sell them not just as ball players, but as arch-rival characters in their own dramatic saga. You got this slick, showtime African-American guy out west, and you got the lunch bucket, floppy-haired white guy with the bruises all over his body. It's central casting, it's perfect. I mean, this was like made in heaven. In 1979, this idea of magic and bird was created, and so that was sort of a no-brainer. We'd have a doubleheader. It would be the Celtics playing first, and the Lakers playing second, and that's the way we did it. And when the Celtics and Lakers both reached the finals just a year into the new TV deal in 1984, it appeared the superstar investment was about to pay off. It was huge. It was probably the biggest moment the NBA had up to that point. You had Boston and LA, East against West. It had all the elements of, of a classic showdown. Including what was becoming the most inescapable element of all. Did we know that the blacks and whites were lining up, the whites with the Celtics, the blacks with, of course we knew that even in the Celtics' own backyard. They land at Logan Airport at the 84 finals. He's getting accosted by various people who are telling him Larry's going to take him down. But this one older African-American gentleman comes up to me and goes, Magic, I want to wish you well. Good luck. I want you to crush the Celtics. And he said, oh, well, where are you from? He said, well, I'm from Boston. And he said, you're from Boston and you're rooting for the Lakers? I thought everybody here was crazy about the Celtics. And he looked right at me and said, now why would I root for those white boys? Boston, after all, was a town still scarred by the ugly busing crisis of the mid-70s, a violent period of urban unrest during which white had been pitted against black. The resulting taint on the city nationally, coupled with a Boston roster littered with white players, affirmed to many black Americans that the Celtics were not the team for them. Even today, people said, you played with the Celtics, and you know, I hated you at that time. You know, I, I wanted Magic to win. I didn't want that damn Larry Bird to win. We had all these black players, but they looked at us because we had Larry Bird leading us as a team that was white. They were perfect archetypes for what was becoming the biggest story in sports. But for the real life players, the narrative was much simpler. It's finally gonna happen. We get to go head to head again. It's just a matter of rolling that ball out there and let's get it on. Welcome then to the Boston Garden and the start of the NBA World Championship Series. I'm Brent Musburger. In each of the last four NBA World Championship Series, either Magic or Bird has competed. But this is the first time that the two have gone head to head for the title. Man, we jumped out on them that first game, and we won in Boston. And with less than a minute to go in game two, the Lakers were closing in on a commanding series lead. From that point on, things began to crumble. Down to nine seconds. Magic rolls the ball. Magic trying to work on Maxwell. Magic has still got it down to two seconds. One second. He's going to have to shoot it. He does it. Cheesy Johnson dribbling the timeout. <laughs> what? what are you doing? The Lakers regained their stride in game three, only to be rudely knocked off it again in game four. And now let's watch it. Cooper and the Celtics, and now the bench is empty. When Kurt Ramis got taken out, 
we start fighting instead of playing. Kareem swings the elbow and now is yelling at Larry Bird. Jaw to jaw. And it made us realize we were not mentally tougher than the Celtics. Magic's just not himself. To be sure they won't let the time run out as they did in game two. Harris steals the ball and the Celtics call a timeout. There are a number of places where, you know, Irvin didn't do what people expected him to do. Tied at 123. He misses the first. Johnson misses them both. Celtics want a timeout. Despondent, Magic Johnson goes to the bench. Bird turnaround hits. Game five went to the Celtics. Game six to the Lakers. It was like 1979 all over again. Down to one game for Bird and Magic. If everybody had to look at it, it probably would have said this is going to be seven game series. No, I thought we'd sweep them in four, but uh, it's went a little bit longer. Now we just have to do it in seven. That's the only time I ever felt that. There ain't no way they're walking out here with a win. Magic Johnson. No way. Lakers had several chances, and here's Larry Bird chucking down the cross. myself in, in being the guy who's going to win it for us and and deliver under pressure and um, it didn't happen I hope he was hurt and hope it killed him he made some bad plays down the stretch and nobody in there was happier than me you know not only when the game makes you feel good but just knowing the other guy's suffering and you know he was I remember after the game that both he and I uh, were in the showers crying and stayed in there for about 35 40 minutes it was hard because not only had we lost to the Boston Celtics, he had lost to his nemesis, Larry Bird. I think he just made me dislike him more, you know, because he was that good. And, and I think you, you, you'd be jealous. You, you're jealous a little bit. Larry, does this get you even with magic for what happened between Michigan State and Indiana State all those many years ago? Yeah, we're professionals now, but uh, I want this one for Terry Holt. Well, it was a big deal, and I remember asking Quinn Buckner about it afterwards. They had a celebration in downtown Boston after they won the championship, and, you know, it was unusual for Larry to have these little outbursts, as Quinn would call them. But, you know, about 11.30 at night, finally he turned to Quinn, he goes, I got him. I finally got him. And he was talking about magic. The league was rejoicing, too. Game seven of the 84 series was one of CBS's highest rated telecasts of the year, and the highest rated game the NBA had ever produced. All of a sudden, whether it was at CBS or Madison Avenue, the sports writers around the country became phenomenal. What is happening here? The absolute foundation in this resurgence was the Celtics and the Lakers, Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. But Magic was in no mood to bask in the accomplishment. I took up a, a media beating tragic magic this is why we say Larry Bird is better it's probably the first time ever in my life I was depressed and I didn't want people to see me it was something I never dealt with in my life that particular series that championship series redefined his whole career because he never stopped working after that magic was on a mission to prove to himself and the world that with the ball in his hands he was still the one in control and after his Lakers ran through the 85 season, he quickly got what he wanted. Another shot at Bird and the Celtics. They won the East, we won the West. So it's like uh, everybody just get ready, sit back, and uh, let's enjoy it. <laughs> but that smile belied the intensity of the clash that awaited. 
if I had a glass of water and any of those guys had been on fire, I would have drank the water and watched them. They called us, you know, chokers and sissies. You know, we didn't like that, and they thought less of us. I knew they did. In 85, we played them four times in exhibition season for some reason. I don't know why they scheduled that. By the fourth game, there was an all-out brawl. They call this one of the greatest rivalries in all of sport, the Celtics, the Lakers. And if that is true, it is the most one-sided rivalry in all of sports. Eight times these two have met for the NBA championship, and eight times the Celtics have won. At guard in his sixth year for Michigan State, and number 32, Magic Johnson. But in the 85 finals, Magic changed the script. Over six grueling games, he masterfully controlled the pace with all-around brilliance. He has a triple-double again. Behind their point guard, the Lakers finally knocked out the Celtics, winning the clinching game in the Boston Garden. Three in six years, L.A. comes to Boston and wins the world title. Redemption for one Magic Johnson. It's a long year last year to wait for this moment right now. Magic had evened the score with Bird on the NBA floor, but the significance of their rivalry and their relationship was still just taking hold. You crazy. <laughs> I said, you crazy. I'm not shooting a commercial with Larry. So I said, OK, what, we're going to shoot it in LA? I would never went to LA to film it. Well, where are we going to shoot it? If you want to shoot a commercial, come to my house. I was like, oh, no. One stop light. And I thought Lansing was small. I think the plan was, I'm going to go here, I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do, and I'm trying to get up out of here. My plan was that. Even after Converse had convinced Magic and Bird to film a sneaker ad together in the summer of 85, a question remained. How would the two hated rivals on the court get along off of it. I don't know how he's going to react. I don't know how I'm going to react. We even shake hands, so how are we going to do a commercial together? The ad was to be filmed at the home Bird had built for his mom. It featured a full-length basketball court, the day's first location. So they say, OK, you're playing one-on-one, -on -one, and I'm looking at Larry, and he's looking at me like, is this real? Are we playing, playing? Because, you know, this, this, is, this is magic and bird. I could just hear Larry, you know, starting in on, well, you bring it to the basket, and I'm going to send it 30 rows up. So the guy was like, no, no, not like that. A fun game. We were both like, oh, OK. Like, <laughs> like you can see this relief coming over both of our faces. That brief detente led to the next stage, dialogue. We sat down next to each other. How was your summer? Oh, it's going good. How was yours? It's going great. I said, man, it's a nice spread you got. He's asked me, is this where you play? I said, yeah, I play here. If it's not windy, if it's raining or windy, I go to the gym. But this is where I do all my work. I see that tractor. You work on the, on the tractor? He said, man, I work on this tractor every day. Larry Bird work on the tractor? He said, yeah. It's just them two walking and talking, and every once in a while they'd stop and one of them would say something, and then they'd start laughing. Then they said, okay, break, it's lunch break time. I was going to my trailer. He said, no, my mother has prepared lunch for us up at the house. We went up to the house, and we sat down there, and we talked, and my mom, my brothers, thought the world of him. His mother was so nice, making sure I had enough to eat. I just saw my mother. It was crazy. He charmed her. I mean, you can see it. But that's magic. He makes everybody feel welcome and warm, and he's a con man. <laughs> and while magic charmed Georgia Bird, it was someone else who intrigued her son. He met Irvin at lunch. Irvin was a good dude. I like Irvin a lot better than magic. I was just so happy to finally be Irvin with him. 
because Magic was like, I don't know if I want to get to know this guy. But Irvin got a chance to talk about family, how he grew up. We just, we just became two relaxed guys just talking. That day was great. It was a great day, beautiful day. Still, for Bird, ever the competitor, that's all it was, just one day. Magic thinks the next year, okay, well, now we're great friends, so, you know, after the game, we're going to go out, we're going to have a, a beer, and Larry's like, no, you're right. I know you better. You're a good guy, but I still don't want anything to do with you. He's a happy-go-lucky guy. If me and him got to be really good friends, go out on the court, he could still play the same game. I couldn't. I mean, that's just the way it is. But when the ad hit the airwaves, for others, the perception changed. I saw those limousines going through the cornfields, and I said, no. They didn't sell themselves out. I heard Converse made a pair of bird shoes for last year's MVP. Yep. But they made a pair of Magic shoes for this year's MVP. OK, Magic, show me what you got. Well, this is really a business thing. The bird shoe, the magic shoe. And maybe that's where the business thing started to get bigger and began to trump who they both really were. It polarized the whole idea of lunch bucket versus Hollywood, white versus black. Just cemented all the differences between them. Kids weren't wearing black gym shoes because they didn't want to be associated with the Larry Bird camp. You wore your white Converse. The basketball rivals had morphed into cultural warriors, and race, more than ever, had become an unavoidable part of the conversation. Yo! But nothing about Bird and Magic had ever been as simple as black and white. One of the big reasons this rivalry became so emblematic of so many things is because it was an easy dichotomy for people to understand. But it's crazy to simplify it as saying white people like Bird and black people like Magic because 13% of the country is black. It wasn't like 87% of basketball fans preferred the Celtics. Who's your favorite basketball player? Magic Johnson. Who's your favorite movie star? Eddie Murphy. Pino, all you ever talk about is nigga this and nigga that. And all your favorite people are so-called niggas. It's different. Magic, Eddie, Prince are not niggas. I mean, they're not black. I mean, let me explain myself. Has the N-word ever been used by a white person to describe Irvin? I doubt it. But as Magic enjoyed his image as a crossover star, it was Bird, the one-time great white hope, who had further emerged as the polarizing racial figure, due in part to that era's increasingly conservative political climate. The rolling back institutionally of the achievements of the Civil Rights Movement were going on apace from about 1975 on. But the triumph of the movement that rolled it back took place in the 1980s. And I think there was people who were very aware in the black community of what was going on. And I think there was a lot of sublimated frustration. And I think one of the ways it got sublimated was into basketball. And I think Larry, through no fault of his own, was the receptacle within which the lingering resentments somehow floated. And after Bird led the Celtics to the championship in 1986, his third in the pros, winning his third straight MVP award in the process, the resentment grew. I always felt that the press was biased in favor of Larry Bird. It always felt to me like they were gonna make Larry the hero. You know, you'd see somebody score and Larry would be in a cast in a suit on the bench and they'd say, Larry Bird made that possible a couple weeks ago when he told that guy he could do it and he just did it. They, they gonna get his motherfucker the assistant, he not in the game? Not to be racist, but we have a white guy who's the best in the world. And it's predominantly a black sport now, and you got a guy like Larry Bird who can't run, who can't jump, but can do everything out there. That don't mean nothing to me. It don't mean anything to me. It never has. I don't know why. I mean, am I doing something wrong here? Bird may have sought to avoid the conversation entirely, but the more he won, the less he could escape it. In 1987, after Boston beat the Detroit Pistons to advance to the finals for the fourth straight year, Pistons rookie Dennis Rodman called Bird overrated because he was white. His teammate Isaiah Thomas then chimed in with some thoughts of his own.
Kaepernick. If he was black, he'd be just another good guy. <laughs> I can remember uh, in the locker room, I think it was Jack McMullen came up to me and said, Isaiah just said, boom, 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 boom. And I go, so? He didn't care. He didn't care. Everybody else around him cared very deeply in the days and weeks as it turned out ahead. I mean, the media made it out like it was something, but it didn't matter to me what Isaiah or Dennis Rodman said, and it still don't. It has no bearing on what I do in my life. He doesn't see race. He really doesn't. Uh, and he could have. This guy grew up poor, white, in southern Indiana. Southern Indiana, the home, by the way, of the modern Ku Klux Klan. How he managed not to be affected by the cultural milieu that he grew up in is, I think, a miracle. It's, to me, it's inexplicable. When well, I was in about sixth or seventh grade, I couldn't wait till school to be over, because I knew over on the courts, the waiters from the hotel would be over there. They were black, older, and they let me play. You know, I always looked at that as, I got an opportunity to play against a black man, and they treated me good. I couldn't wait to play against the best, and at that time, they were the best. And in 1987, as Bird vied with magic to be the best, the flap over Isaiah Thomas's racially-fueled remarks forced Bird to address his least favorite topic at the worst possible time. I had to go to a press conference when I was in L.A. trying to get ready to play the Lakers, and tell people, I didn't care, this don't bother me. The main thing is, if the statements or whatever was said doesn't bother me, I don't think it should bother any of us. From playing all year, trying to get back to the finals and play against Magic, this was a distraction. Bird was facing off against Magic for the third time in four years. And if their relationship had softened, the determination to beat each other had not. As game four proved, the level of competition between them was higher than ever. Bird played awesome down the stretch of that game. Trailing 2-1 in the series, the Celtics were down by one point in the final minute of the game. But Larry Bird wouldn't be easily vanquished. Open his aim. Bird goes for three. With seven seconds left, though, the Lakers still had life. Three years earlier in the 84 finals, Magic had flubbed a similar situation. But this was a different Magic, one with a whole new bag of tricks. My man switched to Kareem, and Kevin McHale jumped out to me. As soon as I saw Kevin, I said, oh, I'm taking him. You know, Magic puts it on the floor, a couple head and shoulder fakes, and he raised up in the air. And there was nobody that was going to get that shot. I remember after they called timeout thinking, there's still a shot here. Celtics may still win this game. Well, they set up a great play. Bird walked Worthy all the way up, forced the denial all the way up. We've done it before. Clear everybody out, go to the ball and break to the corner. He caught it here, and as he caught it, all he had to do was turn. He just turned, and he just let this thing go. Got a wide open look, couldn't believe it. And I'm standing right there, it is straight as an arrow. Dead on. And the Lakers have won. They were lucky, because it was right on line. He looked at me like, how did you ever leave me that wide open? <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. Changed the whole series. The Lakers won the series in six. And in the aftermath of a year in which Magic had won his first MVP, the rivalry suddenly took on a new tone. Magic's just a great basketball player. He's the best I've ever seen, you know. I... Unbelievable. I don't know what to say. I was shocked that he said it, because I thought to myself, maybe this is the beginning of a new era that's not going to include him. It was the passing of the torch a little bit. After vanquishing Bird in 87, Magic wasn't done winning. 
The following year, he squared off in the finals against his good friend Isaiah Thomas and the Pistons, beating them to become the NBA's first repeat champions in two decades. By the dawn of the 90s, he'd won five titles, played in eight finals, and equaled Bird's MVP tally of three. But the more Magic won, the less Irvin seemed to be around to reap the spoils. Once I tasted the champagne and the championship, I wanted more of that and more of that. So Magic kept growing because we were successful. And the persona and all of that came with that. The Prince of L.A. was now the king. And in Hollywood, being royalty had its perks. Wow. What was Irvin Johnson's vice? Now you know my publicist wants me to say winning. But women loved Irvin. Back then, before voicemail, they used to have these mail slots in the hotels where you leave your key. And when we get into a town, Irvin's mail slot would be so packed and it would be just Susan and a phone number, Linda and a phone number, Joyce and a phone number. I mean, that was every city, every, every time. I was on top of my game as magic, so I needed all that around me at that time. The women, the this, the that, Hollywood. Magic was living in a context of sybaritic excess from the minute he walked in the door, and he developed a sweet tooth for it. Sex with several women at the same time. Yeah. Like I said, women have different fantasies. Some want to be with two or three at a time. You know, one time I had six at one time. That's just... I really do believe he looks upon Magic Johnson as a movie character he played. I think Irvin got overwhelmed in L.A. by what it meant to be a star. That's probably true, that um, the Magic ego swallowed Irvin a little bit, but that's okay, because I couldn't win five championships without that. Through all of this haze of, of women and money and fame and fortune, he still kept basketball at number one. He never seemed to lose that focus. Larry had two jobs his last seven years of playing. It was playing basketball, and then it was him being committed to taking care of his back. He had first heard it in 1985, building the driveway at his mom's house back in French Lick. Larry decides to do it himself. This is Larry Bird, the superstar, out there, breaking his back, literally shoveling gravel. And that, that was the beginning of a process. I would see him on TV laying down, and, and then they told me that he had to lay down on planes, different things like that, and I was like, wow. As magic soared through the prime of his career, Bird was breaking down. His deteriorating back and punishing style of play proving an excruciating mix. From 88 to 92, it was painful to watch. It was painful to cover. Larry is quite ornery when he's not feeling well, which means he was ornery for those next four years. He could manage the pain in a way that very few people can do. There'd be days he could come in the office and he couldn't stand up straight. But even after two ruptured Achilles tendons and surgery on his back in 1991, Bird kept going to work. Product of a lesson learned many years before, seeing the swollen ankle of a man long since gone. Well, we don't know if it broke or not, but it looked broke to me. I had to go to work and he had to get his boot on and it took everything I had to help him get that boot on his foot. Then he stood up limping and he says, well, I'll see you this weekend because he was working construction at the time. And I was pretty amazed how he could fight through that all week and come home on the weekend. And it was black and swollen. And he'd sit around on the weekend and put that boot on and go again. If you get paid to go to work, you got to go to work. It was a situation that he was seeing almost daily. He had lost the structural stability in his spine. So it would slip into abnormal positions to try and lock itself to get an artificial stability. That's like getting your finger stuck in a door and somebody's still pushing on the door. So what we had to do was unlock his spine, realign it, do techniques that would hold that for four hours, six hours, that type of thing, and then he'd go play basketball. Every time 
I would play. I was wondering if I was going to be in a wheelchair. Was I ever going to be able to, you know, walk on the beach or hold my kids? His pain and his quest for basketball became all-encompassing. Very few people really knew what Larry was living with because this was Larry's issue, and there was no sharing of his pain. You know, I probably should have retired in 88, 89, but uh, it's that competition. Maybe one more chance, maybe Magic get together in the finals, but it never happened. I'm sleeping, really, laying down, just waiting on the game, and uh, the you know, phone rings, and uh, the voice says, hey, you got to uh, come back to L.A. And uh, I said, okay, why? Well, I can't tell you until you get to L.A. So I said, okay. Two hours later, he was in the office of Lakers team physician Michael Melman. Dr. Melman starts to tell me that, you know, uh, through the physical that I took, that um, they discovered that I had HIV. First time ever in my life, I'm such a control freak, right, and do things the right way. I'm out of control. Oh, it was everything. How is it possible? What happened? How did it happen to me? And my mind is racing, you know, and uh, and then you just you just devastated. Further complicating things, Magic had gotten married just two months earlier, and he feared the worst for his new bride, Cookie, who was pregnant with their first child. I don't know what's going to happen with my wife and my baby. I don't know what's going to happen to me. I don't have control of the situation, and I was lost just for that next two or three weeks. And after Magic learned neither his wife nor his unborn child were infected, he began revealing the news to his inner circle. The phone rang, and it was Magic's agent, Lon Rosen. And he said, Irvin's looking for you. Call him. And I said, I'll call him when I get to Paramount. And he says, call him now. I said, Lon, I'll call, I'll call him when I get to Paramount. I'll be there in 20 minutes. And he said, you got to call him now. Irvin's HIV positive. Um, I remember I was sitting on the bed. I remember standing up at that point. And I said, how is that possible? I'm thinking Irvin's going to get skinny and die. I mean, literally. That's what I thought. Urban's going to get skinny and die. The first person I thought of was Larry. I wonder what Larry thinks. The day that I heard about magic, it just sort of changed my love for basketball. It shook me up. You know, you get, a, you get that feeling, probably the same type of feeling I had when my father died. He wants to understand why, you know, how can I talk to him? I need to speak to him. It was just really important for Larry to talk to him. You know, I, you know, sort of, I don't know. I wanted to hear it from him. Probably didn't believe it. He calls me and uh, we're talking. You know, it's just, how you doing? I heard about it. And uh, you can almost hear both of us with some uh, tears in our eyes. And I'm choked up because he did call me and uh, you know when something happens to you And then you find out who really your friends are and people who really care about you. Um, you figure all those battles 
all those things we had to go through as warriors, as competitors, and as men. And um, here this man says, hey, you know what, man, you okay. And so um, that was the greatest moment for me too, you know, to have him check on me and to make sure I was okay. First of all, let me say good, a good after late afternoon. Um, because of uh, the HIV virus that I have attained, uh, I will have to retire from the Lakers uh, today. It's the only press conference I've ever been in where I've seen reporters cry. I mean, we thought this guy was in total denial. I plan on going on, living for a long time, bugging you guys like I've always have. We thought this, this smile was going to be wiped off his face forever, and he was going to die, but we're going to watch him die in public. I just remember in the room, he was joking, and I'm sitting there looking at him, crying, and he's like, Coop, man, I'm going to be OK. I'm going to be OK. It's going to be all right. I am going to go on. I'm going to beat it, and I'm going to have fun. Sure, come on. You're, you're going to beat this? And to him, it was a contest. Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, AIDS and Magic Johnson, he's same thing. It's just a, a, a different game, different rules, but I'm still going to win. He wasn't planning on going nowhere. Urban was planning that day to find the right medicine, to eat right, get rest, and live forever. That's what he was planning. Thank you again, and I'll see you soon. But as Magic put up a positive public face, his nemesis, still out of sorts, shed the mask he had hidden behind for years. He was visibly like, wow, how could that happen? You know, they just that it was just, it really set him back. Probably the two toughest days I've had since my father passed away. And I've been very depressed and, and sort of been out of it. I listened to him talk in this press conference about how devastated he was. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, God damn, Larry found Irvin. You know, just out of the blue, something like that happening. It's just, I've never had uh, other than one other instance. I didn't, and I was hoping I'd never see that again because I remember how I felt weeks after that. And yesterday was just, just a sad day. And at his game that night, Bird was forced to confront pain he couldn't so easily play through. Didn't want to be there that night. First time ever. And really last. I remember we played the Atlanta. Had no feel for the game, you know. This wasn't, wasn't a good time to be out there. Never had that before. That night he threw a pass. I'll never forget, he threw a half court pass behind his back for a layup. And if you blurred your eyes, you squinted your eyes, it looked like magic. And that was Larry saying goodbye. You know, I mean, this competition thing is, is, is amazing, what it does to you. What you put your body through and what you do and what you say and how you feel and knowing that he's not there wouldn't feel right. But I think it's all them years that, you know, what's he doing? What if he's practicing this hard? I bet he shot 500 shots a day and I didn't get 500 in. It's always that mind games. Bird played through the 91-92 season, his last in the NBA but a part of him was already gone. I didn't check the papers anymore. You know, it didn't matter. Uh, I still wanted to compete, you know, but uh, it wasn't the same. It really wasn't. With the exception of that year when he was called Tragic Johnson, because on the basketball court, things didn't shake down properly, this is the first time I'm hearing Ignorance, hatred, vicious, nasty things. There were some of my former teammates who had their own little things that they were talking about and why this happened to me. You know anybody else that's heterosexually got it? Come on, man, you're in denial. I've been called gay, faggot, urban's lover. I've been called all that shit. Lon Rosen got a call from Isaiah Thomas asking, you know, I keep hearing Magic's gay. And Lon said, well, for crying out loud, you know better than anybody he isn't. You're one of his best friends. And he said, well, 
We don't know what's going on in Hollywood. And the fact that Isaiah was questioning why he got this, I think it was really, really hurtful to him. He used to say, you know, I don't want people to stop shaking my hand and giving me my hugs. He loves to be loved. And um, that's what bothered him the most, that people would change in relationship to him. He would show up at the Lakers facility to work out and to shoot some baskets, and he'd try to engage his teammates and say, hey, you want to play a little one-on-one -on -one before practice? And, oh, geez, no, I can't. I got to go get taped. Or, oh, geez, I got work to do. I got to do something else. The worst thing of all of this, that I couldn't play basketball. I don't even think dealing with HIV, it was that I couldn't play. The game, the surroundings was his whole world. That's his personality. When you take that away, you know, he's, you're hurting. I knew he was hurting in a big way. The only sex is safe sex, and that's no sex. As basketball went on without him, Magic performed ably in his new role as HIV educator and spokesman. I'm helping every way that I can. But he still pined for the arena which had made him a star. So when he was invited to play in the 1992 NBA All-Star Game, he jumped at the chance, promptly stealing the show and winning MVP honors. But that was just a warm-up for the encore magic had up his sleeve. He's not done yet because we're going to go to Barcelona and bring back the gold for everyone here in the United States. Thanks, man. For the first time ever, NBA players would be competing in the Olympics. And Magic, armed with a message, was not about to miss the show. It would have proved to people that you were not going to get the disease playing against me. And then also for me, too, personally. You know, it was therapy. It was a way to say, man, yeah, you get to do this one more time. There was also one other perk. I think playing with Larry was very important. That's something they talked about. I mean, he was going to be on the dream team. He was going to be with Michael. He was going to be with Barkley. But he was going to play with Larry. Magic kept saying to him, I just want to get you out on that court one more time. Let's just have one more sequence like we had all the way back in 1978. But it was interesting that with Magic being the one that was HIV positive, he felt great. He was in the best shape of his life. I got a smile on my face. He had worked so hard to make sure he didn't go there as a token player. And here was Larry, who couldn't even practice, who could barely move. But you know what? Didn't matter. We were still together. You know, didn't matter. Hold me close and hold me fast. The magic spell you cast. This is love the unrose. When and when he got his opportunity, he swished a few. And who's taking the last shot with the game on the line? When I got my opportunity, I still was magic. Fourteen years after they'd first crossed paths, the smiling kid from Lansing and the shy boy from French Lick were happily back together in Barcelona. But it took just one glance outside their hotel's front door each morning for them to see that as far as they had come, they were as far apart as ever. The only way you walk out that door if you wanted attention. But I asked this guy, I know, how can you get around this? You know, it's got to be a way. Lo and behold, there was a side door. You can go wherever you want. I was going to tell him about it, but seeing that smile on his face, the closer you got to that front door, come on. He didn't want no side door. You know Irvin. He'd go right in the middle of him. Turn the long way, sweetheart. There you go. I'm going out the front because that's who I am. I don't go out the back. I don't go out the side. That's not me. If you want to go somewhere in a hurry, there's a, there's a door that leads you there. 
I found it. I respected him for that. And so, hell, I would try to find a, a slide door for him. <laughs> and we never tried to change each other. That's what made this relationship great. One of my pet peeves always is when people say, oh, Michael Jordan saved the NBA. Bullshit. Bullshit. Magic and Larry saved the NBA. That's who saved the NBA. Magic and Larry. Magic and Larry. Bird and Magic. To the millions who once watched them, now more than ever, they are inseparable. A pair of athletes thrown together by the cosmos to compete. A pair of men who discovered a bond in the midst of that competition. Decades removed from the height of their rivalry, their bond endures. Two impossibly different men with a connection only they can fully grasp. It's almost like a private little club and only the two of them are in it. And every once in a while they need to show up to have a reunion and pay their dues to each other. But they don't need the day-to-day -day contact that most friends need. It's just not that kind of relationship. I always, I always get this good feeling when I know I'm going to see him because uh, he makes you feel good. You know, he really does. <laughs> he's unbelievable. He's very private, but if he's your friend, man, you got a friend for life. And Larry Bird is a straight shooter. He'll tell you when he don't like you. That's one thing I wish I could have from him, that, that he has that I don't have. I wish I had that. I mean, he walked in here, this whole room would change. And uh, maybe that's what I always wanted to be, but I just couldn't. This has been a presentation of HBO Sports.